Phase 5 of the MCU has begun, and boy has it, with Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, directed once again by Peyton Reed. Welcome to my non-spoiler review of the film. I'm going to go through some stuff that is not going to be spoilerific with the plot, and just tell you what I thought about the movie, and if I think you should go see it. Going into the movie, the only thing I had heard about the film, I tried to avoid the critics' reviews, is that... Jonathan Majors is amazing as King the Conqueror and that it's a very science fiction-y type of film. And that is true, but I did hear there was some negative criticism about this film. And while I don't think this movie is perfect by any means, there are some flaws. And most of which I'm going to go over in my spoiler review. I did enjoy the film and really the purpose of this movie, y'all. It really is to set the foundation for what's coming in Phase 5 and in Phase 6. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Maybe I'm the only one who feels this way, y'all, but I feel like the Ant-Man movies are underrated. The previous two films are smaller, no pun intended, sort of family-driven quasi-comedies. They're not like the big, grandiose, you know, MCU epic film like A Civil War and definitely not like Infinity War. There are much smaller films, and sometimes I feel like I'm the only person who really liked Ant-Man 2. Like, I really liked that movie, and... I go online and people don't like it as much as me and some straight up hate it. The thing is, I feel like a lot of people think that the Ant-Man movies, the first two, aren't really that important to the overall grand scheme of the MCU, the overarching story. And I do agree with that to a degree. I think the Ant-Man movies, although they do introduce things like the Quantum Realm, which is very important for stuff like Avengers Endgame, you can really, for the most part, kind of skip them. You're not going to miss too much. You'll miss a little bit of context, but it won't be that much, and it's pretty easy to catch up on what happened. This movie, though, totally different story. Quantum Mania really adds layers to the Marvel Cinematic Universe by not only exploring the quantum realm, but also telling us a heck of a lot more about Kang the Conqueror than what we knew from just the Loki show and He Who Remains. When it comes to this movie, if you're asking, do I have to watch the Disney Plus shows? I will say this. It really is helpful if you've seen the first season of Loki. It is helpful. It's not a must-see thing, but it is helpful. Obviously, by going into this film, it's best that you do watch the first two Ant-Man movies if you haven't seen it. But uh, this movie, unlike the previous two, is very important because now we have the introduction of aspects of the MCU going into Phase 5 and 6 that are not only crucial to the plot, but also, besides all of that, this movie feels different than the previous two. The majority of this movie does take place in the quantum realm, and because of that, this film is a special effects spectacle. That's one thing I want to talk to you all about real quick, is before we get to the actual like acting and the plot, is the special effects in this film. Not since, I would say, Endgame and maybe even the Doctor Strange films have I really noticed, and and I I know all these movies have great special effects, right? They have big budgets, you have a very talented team at Marvel working on this, so there's no question the special effects are going to look good, but with this one, it definitely had a big spectacle. The last third of this film is huge, it feels as big, and I I might get heat for this, but I'm going to be real with you. Although it takes place in the quantum realm, which is a very small, literally subatomic universe existing underneath our universe, it's as big as the finale of Black Panther 2. Like, there's a huge battle at the end, and I saw some folks comparing it to Star Wars, and I'm just going to say this. The, the thing, the truth is, the first act, the first two acts of the movie, the first two thirds of it, actually feels more like Star Trek. And the pacing of the movie does not let up. It's a relatively fast-paced movie. We get into the action and into the quantum realm pretty quickly into the film. The characters that were more comic relief in the other two Ant-Man movies are absent from this film. And that does kind of hurt it if you're a huge fan of those characters. I won't lie to you. They're somewhat missed here. But the story here, like the purpose of this was not even to go down the comedic route there is some comedy in the movie obviously you're gonna get that the movie's wacky because we're talking about an ant man and ants and you know just 
the whole concept is just ridiculous, to be honest with you, in, in a good way. And I say that in a good way. But uh, the first two thirds felt like Star Trek. Like literally, as I'm watching the first act of the film and we see the quantum realm, I'm over here like, okay, this feels like something that like Captain Kirk, Spock, and McCoy would explore. Like it really had that vibe, y'all. Really, really had that vibe. And then the last third felt like a Star Wars movie. But of course, it went back to being a Marvel film. So expect like a big sort of blue screen special effects spectacle. Now, Outside of that, we got to talk about the actual characters of the film. Paul Rudd reprises his role as Scott Lang, Ant-Man, and his characters dealing with the fame and really, you know, notoriety that came from the things that the Avengers did in the previous Avengers films. He's known now, he's respected, he's beloved by the public, but it's not really... Like, it doesn't really play into the plot that much. There's some... I thought they were going to go in the direction where Scott Lang was, like, kind of like an overbloated, egotistical guy. Didn't really go in that direction. There were some little aspects here and there, but really the story is mostly about how even though he is the Ant-Man, even though he might not be as powerful as the gods and the, the gamma ray uh, infested or, or you know, the, the, the hugely powerful, you know, Captain Marvel level, you know, Black Widow overpowered MCU characters, that doesn't mean he doesn't have a place in this universe. It does not mean that. Besides that, Evangeline Lilly plays Hope Van Dyne, once again, the Wasp. I felt like she was a little bit maybe underused in this film. The movie's not even that long. The movie's about two hours and four minutes. It's not a big three-hour, two-and-a-half-hour film, but they crammed a lot in. It's still, you know, they could have done more with her character. And then, as expected, as expected, we have the legendary Michelle Pfeiffer and the legendary Michael Douglas playing Hank, Hank Pym and the original Wasp, Janet Van Dyne, who was in the quantum realm for decades and was hiding a terrible secret about what she witnessed in that quantum realm that ties into the plot of this movie. So if you were wondering what the heck Janet did during her time in there, that's fully explained in this film. But as expected, man, the main event, the MVP of this movie... The critics were right about this one is Mr. Jonathan Majors as Kang the Conqueror. Kang the Conqueror is the opposite of a mustache twirling villain, but there are aspects of him being that in the movie. He can go from being this emotional, and it's all about the way he takes the character and performs it. His facials, his you see in his eyes like concern, you see in his eyes, you know, uh, uh sort of, in a way, he almost feels guilty for what he has to do. Uh, you can actually, he emotes really well on screen, but then he also can become a wacky villain as well. But as you see the movie, you kind of start to wonder whether or not he really is a villain because his perspective on what's going on in the multiverse, and I'm not going to go into it here, is definitely one that is going to be tying into the rest of this you know, phase and the next one because... It's sort of like the the uh, He Who Remains character where he's portrayed as a bit of a villain, but then the question is, is he really as bad as some of his variants? And that's kind of what is teased throughout this movie. You know, obviously, if you know about Kang the Conqueror, you kind of know where the story's going. You might not know exactly where it's going, but you know what he's all about. And uh, I think it does a really good job of you know, giving us teases. Definitely, without question, by the end of this film, when the credits are done, mid-credit and post-credit scene, you're going to want to see Kang Dynasty. You're going to want to see more of Loki stuff. You're going to want to see where this story goes. They do a great job of teasing things for the future. Now, when it comes to the plot, you know, a lot of folks didn't like the plot. I was fine with it. I enjoyed it. And really what I think kind of worked for this movie was the world building. You know, the world building I thought was fantastic. The way they do the quantum realm, you meet a bunch of new characters in a new world. Like I said, it feels like Star Trek. But I actually forgot to mention one important person, and that is Catherine Newton as Cassie Lang. She's pretty good in this movie. They are no question setting her up to be a future you know, hero. I don't know if it's going to be Young Avengers or what, but she gets a lot, and I mean a lot of screen time here. You could have called this movie Ant-Man and Wasp and Cassie, and it would be an appropriate title because she's almost like the third hero, but everyone gets their moment to shine. Everyone does, including Hank, including Janet, including Kang, of course. He has multiple moments to shine. 
I really like how they are tying in the quantum realm to Kang to what's going to happen in the future and what's already happened in the past. Like, I really like that Avengers Endgame was only the beginning of the time travel stuff. And I want to tell you this right off the hop too, man. When it comes to time travel stories, I've said this a lot. I love time travel stories. I love Back to the Future. I love Terminator. I love the time travel stuff in Dragon Ball. Like, I'm a huge fan of time travel stuff, but when you really sit there late at night at 2 in the morning and try to logically make sense of it, you're probably going to find holes. Right, You're probably going to find holes. There are a couple of holes in this movie when it comes to time travel stuff. It's not so much the writing. It's more so, although there is a couple of holes in the writing, which I'm not going to get to in the non-spoiler. There's a few things you'll notice, or you might notice it. But uh, time travel stuff is very hard to make sense of. They're trying their best, though. And you can tell they're trying their best to explain this to a casual audience. If you're worried about like taking your mom or your girlfriend to this who might not really be an avid comic book reader, you don't have to worry too much in that, yes, the movie's extremely nerdy. And yes, comic book fans and sci-fi fans are going to eat this movie up. They're going to eat it up. They're gonna, I'm telling you that. Casuals might not eat this movie up in the same way that like Winter Soldier was or Civil War, you know, very basic stories. That's not what this is. This is not a spy espionage story. This is a fantasy sci-fi adventure. That's really what the movie is. It kind of had Land of the Lost vibes going. Remember Land of the Lost? Really reminds me. You know what? That's what it should be compared to. Land of the Lost, man, because that's what it really felt like in this movie. But yeah, big special effects film. Lots of there's there's some heart in this movie, although not as much as in the previous one, I will say that. Way less comedy. It does not feel like an Ant-Man movie of the previous two as much as the previous two. There's obviously elements of it, but you can tell that Peyton Reed, and actually not just Peyton Reed, but also the writer, um, Jeff Loveness, and of course Kevin Feige, you can tell that the purpose of this movie was without question to show us a glimpse of what Kang can do going forward in Phase 5 and Phase 6. So I'll talk a lot more about that in the um, spoiler review. Other criticisms I have of the film, there's one sub-character, like a sub-villain that I thought was kind of poorly written. I'll go more into that in the spoiler part. Uh, That kind of irritated me a little bit. There's a a couple of things that I thought were a little silly, but because it's an Ant-Man movie, I kind of accepted it. This, This can't really be somebody's first MCU film, dude. This is definitely one for people who have kept up with even casuals who have seen everything else uh or at least most of everything else you don't have to see everything else you have to see most of it uh but it's not like an entry point you know what i mean like entry point movies could be like the spider-man ones obviously iron man even the first avengers those are good movies to start watching if you're new even though you should probably go in order but if you're you know catch it on tv or something you're a new fan there you go this one's not really that because you have to have some prior knowledge You know, these movies work as a combined saga, not as individual stories. So you kind of have to know about Janet, about, you know, Hank, about Scott. Like, if you're going to this without knowing anything, it's not going to be the same experience. You have to know. Luckily, this franchise is so big that most people probably do know. So I really like this film. It's not perfect. It's got issues. I'll go more into that in the spoiler section, but I did enjoy it. But I am a sci-fi fan. I am a comic book fan. Many of you guys are too. Some of the more casual audiences might not dig it as much as us, but it's kind of made for us. You know what I mean? Just being real with you. That's my review. Um, The critics, I'm not going to say they're all wrong. Obviously, a lot of them are more so film critics than like comic book fans. As a comic book fan, you'll appreciate this more. Easily, you'll appreciate it more. As a film critic, you might not like it as much. It all comes down to how much of a fan you are of this type of material. It really comes down to that. And I love Star Trek. I love Star Wars. I love, you know, Marvel. So if you like those things, you'll like this movie. That's it. I'll see you all in the spoiler review. Take care.